Joining us now is entrepreneur and presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy. Vivek, welcome to the show. It's good to see you. Yeah, very glad to have you. Good to see you guys. All right, so make your pitch. Why you instead of the guy that was there last time, Donald Trump? So I see the rest of the GOP field. They are running from something. I am the person in this race who is leading us to something, to our vision of what it actually means to be an American. We're in the middle of a national identity crisis in our country. Faith, patriotism, hard work, family, these things have disappeared. And I think that leaves a moral vacuum in its wake, a black hole. And when you have a black hole that runs that deep, that is when the poison fills the void. And I think we in the GOP and in the conservative movement often obsess over the poison. Wokeism, transgenderism, climatism, COVIDism, globalism, you name it. I view it, these symptoms are just symptoms of a deeper underlying void of purpose and meaning. And I think I'm in the candidate in this race who's actually offering an affirmative vision as opposed to just mm. saying that we're not doing what the left is doing. No, individual, family, nation, God, these are the things that ground us. I think we should talk about them in mm. the open. And I think that's why we're having success early on. Vivek, uh, there's been some discussions in recent days around your book about January 6th, especially given concurrent potential pending indictments against the former president. Let's go ahead and put this up there on the screen. In your book, you wrote, quote, the loser of the last election refused to concede the race and claimed the election was stolen, raised hundreds of millions of dollars from loyal supporters. It's considering running for executive office again. I'm referring to Donald Trump. Do you still believe that Trump actually lost the election and that January 6th was a dark day for democracy? I was in detail in both of my books and articles, yeah. and I've been very consistent about this throughout. I have seen no evidence. It's exactly what I said in Nation of Victims, and I haven't seen the evidence since, mm -hmm. that there was a scale of ballot fraud that would have changed the outcome of the 2020 presidential election. I've also said in that same book and ever since that the real way the election was in a narrow sense stolen was the suppression of the Hunter Biden laptop story on the eve of the election. I'm data driven. The data mm -hmm. is compelling, including 360-degree polling data that said people would have changed their vote had they been exposed to information that was systematically suppressed. So that's my view. It was big tech interference was the problem. I haven't seen any evidence of systematic ballot fraud being the basis for a difference in result. But most importantly, I think a lot of these factors did lead to and culminate in what happened on January 6th systematic suppression of information. <clears throat> and I think until we have reconciled ourselves with that reality, I'm afraid we're going to see much worse in the future. That is why I'm in this race, to speak the truth and to lead us to something so that we can actually be one nation rather than on our march to a national divorce. And I think I'm better positioned to lead that nation forward than Donald Trump or anybody else in this mm. Republican field. So um, one reason that we're asking some of these questions is because we are expecting indictments with regard to January 6th uh, yeah. for President Trump as soon as today, but uh, potentially this week. You've said in the past that you would pardon former President Trump yes. if you are yourself elected president of the United States. I mean, is that hard and fast or is your mind open to change if there was some new evidence that was presented that you aren't aware of or are you just you're locked in, you're going to pardon him and it really doesn't matter what comes out? No, I'm data-driven. On the first two indictments, I read them completely before making my statement that I would pardon Trump both for the most recent documents case, which for reasons I've laid out elsewhere, we can go into it, I think is absolutely politically motivated, is absolutely a national disaster if this proceeds to a conviction. I think it was a disaster that it proceeded to an indictment. Yes, I would pardon him for that. And I would also pardon him for the New York case. And yes, I know, state law, federal law, mm -hmm. I've made an argument on the pages of the Wall Street Journal as to why the president can pardon him for that crime as well. Based on what I know, I would absolutely pardon him for the alleged offenses underlying a potential January 6th indictment. I think that would be a national disaster as well, potentially even more dangerous than the other two because of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. This one could actually disqualify him from holding office. And I say this as somebody who's now polling third in the Republican field. It would be easier for me if Donald mm -hmm. Trump were not in this race. But that is not the way I want to win this election. I think that we should not become a country where the party in power uses police force to indict and eliminate its political opposition. So That's Vivek, not the way just, we do things in this country. 
I want to get uh, clarity on your position. So yes. on the documents case in particular, first of all, I want to ask you, you know, given what we know, and he deserves his day yeah. in court, et cetera, but looks pretty clear. He held on to a bunch of very classified material uh, when he started getting calls from the government and from law enforcement saying, hey, you know, we know you've got some things. Will you cooperate with us? According to what's been presented so far, it looks like not only did he not cooperate, that he, you know, moved some boxes around and tried to conceal exactly what he had. Don't you think that a private citizen that engaged in those types of activities, wouldn't they also be indicted and probably given a lot less grace and a lot fewer second chances than former President Trump was in this instance? So I track the facts against the law. And one critical feature, Crystal, is that this was the former president of the United States, and there is a statute that covers former presidents of the United States and how they relate to both classified and unclassified documents. That's mm. the Presidential Records Act. That came after the act under which he was indicted, which I think is one of the most un-American statutes, the Espionage Act. And I wrote an extensive piece in the Wall Street Journal about why I would repeal that act. It's been abused for most of our national history. I think it was abused here. So the Presidential Records Act makes clear what access a president of the United States has to at least unclassified documents. On the theory that he's being prosecuted against, actually the Espionage Act does not distinguish between classified or unclassified documents. Correct. Which means that there's a strong legal argument that the Presidential Records Act supersedes the Espionage mm -hmm. Act as it relates to presidents who touch bad, who, who deal with classified or unclassified documents. So and your so I issue believe in tracking the law very carefully. It's a legal so point, you actually, but this is So you law. actually don't think that he deserved indictment here and that it doesn't have to... So you think a president, in theory, could be indicted or a former president could be indicted. You just disagree with this particular legal case? Is that is that the gist of your position here? That's absolutely correct. On strong legal footing, this was a bad judgment. And I want to be very clear. I would have mm. made in many of these instances, probably in every one of these instances, different judgments than mm. Donald Trump made. And I will remind you, I'm running against him for right. this nation in a Republican primary. But we cannot conflate a bad judgment with a crime. We have to actually match it up with the law. That's the problem with the Alvin Bragg indictment. That's the problem with the first Jack Smith indictment. These facts do not meet the law and the legal test relevant to the actual facts at issue. And the fact that that indictment in 49 pages did not once mention the Presidential Records Act is one of many signs of politicization. They included statements that Trump had made on the campaign trail against Hillary Clinton in an indictment. I had no mm. place in an indictment. But if you were going to include those statements, they should have also, at least for completeness, included Trump's statement after he won the election, saying that he would not go after Hillary Clinton for those same alleged offenses. Got so it. this reeks to me of politicization, and I think it sets an awful precedent for prosecutions in this well, country. Let me just say, and then I'll let uh, Sagar move on to the, the next area that we want to get from you, but I mean, they literally have him on tape being like, this document is classified. When I was president, I could have declassified it, but I didn't do that. Let me show it to you. It seems to me, and based on a lot of the legal analysis that I've read, and even his own lawyers and team saying that they think that his only out now is not through the legal system, but by winning re-election as president of the United States, that this is a fairly compelling case. It's certainly one that would be brought against an ordinary citizen, so we'll just agree to disagree on our legal analysis here, because I want to move forward. Just one, ahead, one, 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 one small sure. point, because it, it, just, Crystal, the critical point is there is a special law that deals with presidents of the United States. So the analogy of what an ordinary citizen mm. would yeah, or would not, not have been prosecuted Yeah, but he's not president anymore. For, in the, president the, presidential Re the Presidential Records Act explicitly <laughs> is written to cover on, prior Vivek. presidents. You know that if you had documents laying around Crystal, your bathroom be, that have nuclear secrets. I don't want to be defending Trump's behaviors here. <laughs> yes. But I've, I've written extensively, and I believe the law should be applied, actually, rather than making up the law. Well, he'll, have, the his chance to, he'll have his chance to make his case <laughs> yeah. in court. Right. He should. Vivek, yeah. I do actually want to ask you also about another one of your opponents you don't often get asked about as much, uh, Governor Ron DeSantis. We actually have a yeah. more recent poll. Let's go ahead and put this up there on the screen, which actually shows you tied with him in this race. However, interestingly enough, an analysis of some of the voters that he are losing really seems to be around the central role that he's made wokeness in his campaign. Since you have also not only written a book about wokeness, you talk about it quite a bit. Why do you think his message here isn't resonating? And are you learning anything from his continuing fall in the polls? So, Zagar, I want to be clear. My message in this campaign is fundamentally different than Ron DeSantis' message, and yes, when I wrote my book, Woke Inc., long before the word woke was in the Republican parlance, I was analyzing a problem that at that point was poorly understood by many Americans in this country. 
In this campaign, I'm moving us forward. This is about national identity. I think wokeness is just a symptom of mm. our deeper void for purpose and meaning in our country. And I think people are hungry for the real answer here, not playing whack-a-mole with wokeism to climatism, symptomatic therapy. I think people are hungry for the real thing. I want to be very clear. I think Ron DeSantis, in many ways, certainly has been a very good governor in Florida. Of course, you could pick something in anybody's record, so nobody's perfect. But I think, by and large, he's been a good governor. I think there's a lot of parallels between him and Scott Walker, who was also an excellent governor. I think there's a role for everyone in our movement and in our country. He's a great executor. But when it comes to leading this nation, I think as, as Reagan provided in 1980, leading us out of our last national identity crisis, I think what this moment calls for is a leader who has a vision for where we are going, a vision for what it actually means to be an American. And I think there's a difference between being able to articulate and inspire mm. people around an affirmative vision and being able to litigate small ball grievances Maybe. as a way of you know, executing within a state. One of the core things that you have led with is I'm the guy who will actually get it done. You know, I will actually execute the America First movement. But if you look at Governor DeSantis, this is a man who turned a, red, uh, a blue state or at least purplish state actually red. He won a 20 point electoral victory. He has legislated, you know, actually gotten things done through uh, actual political process. So why should we take somebody who is an entrepreneur with no actual political experience over an elected governor of millions of people, somebody who's proven himself in a state legislature when you're looking at your two records on the who can get it done question. Well, look, I've gotten a lot of things done in my life as well. I've built multi-billion dollar companies from scratch, employed thousands of people in this country. And so everyone in this race, from DeSantis to myself, has prior accomplishments to be able to point to. I think the question is the unique challenge of being the president of the United States and leading us forward. One of the things that's different from me and every other single candidate in this race is I'm the only one who is not bound by the constraints applied by the mega donor class. This is the super PAC primary, absolutely. And I think we have a lot of super PAC puppets in this election. Last time around, it was Jeb Bush and Scott Walker. This time, we have a lot more. That so is Ron DeSantis a super PAC puppet? Well, you can look at who, whose campaigns are principally funded by super PACs and follow the facts for yourself. But mm. I, what I will say is that I am unconstrained <laughs> by that. I've put in 15 plus million dollars already of my hard-earned money precisely because I did not want to take a tin can, ring a hat in hand, and ask a bunch of donors for permission to run because that comes with constraints. And so when we're talking about the issues we really need to tackle, shutting down the administrative state from the FBI to the ATF to the IRS to the Department of Education to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, where I've laid out unprecedented clarity in exactly how we will do it on strong legal authority, declaring independence from China, very touchy issue in the Republican donor class. Mm -hmm. Other issues that I'm tackling, other candidates are constrained if they're tied to mega donors that have interests that stop them. My position on Ukraine, very so similar. Is there, let me ask you a follow-up on, on the super PAC thing, because I think that's that's interesting that you have that critique yep. of money and politics. I mean, would you push for a constitutional amendment to change that? Would you? What would you do to try to diminish the influence of that money in politics? And also, equally, isn't it just as problematic that, you know, you've been a very wealthy, successful guy, that you're able to, you know, with your own cash, really impact the, the course of this race. I think that is significantly less problematic, Crystal, because people can at least judge that on its own terms transparently. I think it is far more problematic when you're a representative and a puppet for somebody else's interests. Yeah. And I think that there's a big difference there, right? So Here, would, would you do anything about that, though? For the race. So, so here's what I would do. One thing I would say is, if I'm the nominee, as I expect to be, in the general election, I'll throw out a pass to Joe Biden or whoever my opponent is to catch. Remember, the left was the one that preached Citizens United in 2010, wanted money out of politics. I'll say this. We'll make a handshake deal that we both shun super PAC money. We're not going to show up at events where a super PAC representative is but also you're not, present. you're not looking for any sort of legislative change, though. Well, I, I'm going in order of what's actually achievable okay. mm -hmm. because right. Citizens United is a complicated holding, and, and this is complex terrain, and I've spent years studying this. I share, your, I share much of the left's agita with the influence of money in politics. Read Woke Inc. carefully. That's what the book is about, actually. So that's mm -hmm. the first thing I would do, and I would make that deal with anybody else in this Republican primary. The other thing I would say is there's a difference between super PACs and PACs, right? So there mm -hmm. are these 501c4 entities that have, I mean, such a complicated, unnecessarily Byzantine arrangement. But there are certain rules that say, hey, at least there are certain kinds of money in these other kinds of tortured legal creations. 
where it can't advocate for candidates specifically, but can advocate for issues. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually a reasonable middle ground to say that people still have their First Amendment protections using their own money to advocate for issues or for issues of public importance without actually throwing that money behind a candidate alone. Mm. And so this is complicated. It, it butts up against complex First Amendment jurisprudence. But I think the easiest way to lead is through action. And so I'll make a deal with anybody I'm running against, and if they abide by it, I'll commit to do the same. Shun the super PAC game and revive actually a, a race that is about one person, one vote one person, one voice. That was the promise of the American experiment. We fought a revolution to say that we, the people, settle our differences through free speech and open debate in the public square where every person's voice and vote counts equally. The left used to be on board with that. I hope they still are. I think we live in a moment where Republicans can and should embrace this message too. Vivek, I'm leading yeah. the way on that, and I think that's going to be good for our country if we get there. You talked there about voting, and actually one of the more controversial things that you've put forward is a proposition that to be able to vote under the age of 25, you would either have to serve in the military or to pass a test. Why, you know, a decent portion of the people who are watching the show, uh, you do a lot of online shows, are actually yeah. below the age of 25. What is the case to them to deprive them of their right to vote con uh, under the U.S. Constitution? Let me, and first of all, this would require a constitutional amendment. So you're absolutely right mm -hmm. that the current constitutional state of affairs, this is not something that I'm talking about, is a law. Let me actually share with you, Sagar, this has been distorted many times over, what the heart of my proposal actually is, and then build into that. Nothing you said okay. was inaccurate, but let me get to the heart of the motive. What I've said is every high school student who graduates in this country should have to pass the same civics test that our, each, each of our parents, I'm going to presume, had to pass yes, my, in order to become citizens pass, yes. of this country, right? Every immigrant has to pass in order to become a citizen of this country. I think I'll stand by and wait for a good argument. I still haven't heard one for why high school students in this country, when they turn 18, should not have to know the same things about the country that a naturalized citizen, we demand them to know as well. Mm. And so now let's talk about actually a legal structure we already have. Age 18 to 25, young men in this country have to already Register. You did it. I did it. I'm sure. Yep. Selective service registration on pain of criminal penalties. You have to register for the draft. I've said that I would actually decriminalize that. I don't think that's the way we should do things in this country. But in return for decriminalizing the selective service mandate for men in the age of 18 to 25, I've said we need to instead tie civic privileges to civic duties as our founding fathers envisioned. We live in a constitutional republic. That means something. It means our civic privileges come with civic duties attached to them. That's what our founding fathers envisioned. And that's part of what I think we need to revive. And so I've said that, yes, I believe that at least when you're age 18 to 25, that same window where we have selective service mandates today, you at least have to pass that same civics test that an immigrant has to pass, or else tests aren't for everybody. At least serve the country in some minimal way, military or first responder role. And Let I'll tell you what I expect to happen. Voting rates are very low in kids mm -hmm. and, and young people among the ages of 18 to 25. I think they will skyrocket once we actually make the act of voting mean something. And I think that's actually going to be an important part of our civic revival in our nation. Let me flip it around then. There's been a lot of discussion around Joe Biden's cognitive ability. Should there be then a maximum age to vote and when people do lose their cognitive ability? Like if we're going to have some sort of tests in place on the lower end, should we not have them in place on the higher end as well? So my view is this is not actually a vision for just applying it to young people. This mm. is a vision of what I think should be a civic requirement for really every citizen, but we have to start somewhere. And so I don't believe in somebody who's 60 years old taking away something they've already exercised for all their life. But at some point, if, if we agree that this is a good premise, that we want an educated citizenry that lives out its civic duties, feels that sense of civic duty as they go to the ballot box and live their life as citizens, then we're starting with a clean slate that ages into it with people yeah. who age into being citizens first. I mean, That's the I'm way just, I look at it. I'm just going to be real with you, Vivek. It seems yep. to me like a way to get a group of voters that don't tend to vote very Republican out of the electorate. That's what it feels like to me. Of like a fancy, you've criticism. articulated very well. You know, it's very like civic based, et cetera, et cetera. You use a lot of good language around it. But it seems very convenient that this group of voters is probably not going to vote for you or Donald Trump in very large numbers and are more likely to show up for Joe Biden. Crystal, let me let me see if I can convince you of, of my motivations. I understand. And you don't that's need a to convince me. I'm just yeah. one that's voter. A just so. That's a reasonable, Chris, but, but just yeah. for fun, just for fun, yeah. let's give it, let's, let's, I enjoy these conversations. So here's what I would say. 
First of all, if that were the case, I wouldn't say it now because I don't have an ability to change that in the election that I'm actually running in, right? Mm -hmm. To the contrary, I actually, one of the things that I'm seeing in this campaign is more than any other candidate in either side, in either political party, we're going to college campuses. We're confronting people with diverse views across this country, including young people. 40% of the donors to my campaign, we have 70,000 plus donors already, 40% of them are first time ever donors to the GOP and many of them are actually young. And mm. the reaction that I get when I go to college campuses with this idea, Crystal, is at first, yes, it does make people perk up a little bit. But when we talk <laughs> through the justification and talk through, talk through the actual motive, mm -hmm. I'm actually seeing something beautiful we haven't seen in this country in a long time, which is this notion of persuasion, actually. Uh -huh. we, we treat people as though they're animals, that we're, we're bean counters. And we say, well, you guys are in the Democrat camp. You guys are in the Republican camp. You're in the black voting block. You're in the Asian voting block. Divide people up, vote bank politics. Yeah. As though we're a bunch of animals that jump up to a bone, like a dog jump into a bone for its treat. No, I believe that we're citizens. And what distinguishes us as human beings from animals is that we can engage in open persuasion me, and discourse. And so let me ask you, you know, a little bit about that. I people my motivations, but I'm... I'm I, 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 I doubt I can prove it to you, I'm like but you. I believe that this is going to be right for the country. Mm -hmm. I'm like you. I'm looking at the data, looking at which party that yep. this would benefit. And, you know, that's, but I'm just one person. People can make their own decision. But speaking of the discourse, you know, one thing that I wanted to ask you, I've listened to a lot of your interviews. You know, I think you've gotten a lot of attraction online. You're coming up in the polls. Like, I think people really need to pay attention to what you're saying. And when you talk about people who are concerned with climate, you call them climatists. Yeah. You call them climate cultist. You know, let's just put some of these uh, news stories up on the screen here. You've got record high temperatures that are causing increasing death in Arizona. You've got workers who are dying from heat exhaustion. You've got people who are being choked by wildfire smoke from Canada. You've got an entire state of Florida that's basically uninsurable at this point. And you know, American people are living this reality increasingly at this point. And an overwhelming majority of them, some, you know, two thirds say, yeah, this is a concern for me. So do you have the, the sort of contempt in your heart for them that comes out in that language when you would describe them as climate cultists? I have no contempt in my heart, Crystal. I have deep sympathy for people who are hungry for purpose and meaning and have relocated their desire for faith to the faith in climate instead. But why should I believe in but, facts. But what's, I believe in what's facts. wrong with so, this? So because, we can talk, so yeah, I, I people are experiencing this fact. in their own lives right now. So, Crystal, in any other context, if the people, the trust the science crowd were persuaded by lived experience of individuals of something mm -hmm. that's actually a macro phenomenon, you would laugh yeah. them off the stage as a bunch of rubes who weren't data driven. So okay, let's talk well, data. Well, let's, talk data. Let's, let's talk let's data. Let's talk data. I've got, I've got some if data that I can put up on, this, on the screen. Uh, Go ahead and put I, the I, next, I, and then I, I want to hear from data. you. Go ahead yeah. and put the next pieces up on the screen. We've got um, some record lows in terms of Antarctic sea ice extent. We've got ocean temperatures that are smashing seasonal records. We had just the hottest June on record. I think it might be the helpful for me to lay out my views, uh, the Crystal, because I think you're saying things well, I, just, I agree with. Okay, you're saying things so I agree with. Right? Tell, me so, what's, tell me what I'm getting wrong here and why this is not something that people should be concerned about and why they're in a cult if they are concerned about it. Sure. So let me lay out some hard facts, both about my views and facts on the ground. Okay. Sure. Are global surface temperatures going up? Yes. Is that likely due to man-made causes? Yes. Is that an existential threat to humanity? There is no evidence to support that. To the contrary, eight times as many people die of cold temperatures rather than warm ones. The Earth today is more covered by green surface area than it was even a century ago because carbon dioxide is plant food. Plants actually grow in slightly warmer climates. The climate disaster-related death rate mm -hmm. is down by 98% over the last century, directly attributable to more abundant and plentiful access and use of fossil fuels. So I want to be really clear about my view. This is not a, does climate change exist or not? It's the wrong framing mm -hmm. of the question. The question is, what impacts human prosperity, human flourishing, in a world in which there are net positive and net negative effects of climate, but also net positive and net negative effects of the use of fossil fuels. I also find it to be a mystery, and it's a mystery maybe you can help me solve, Crystal. Why is it that many of the people who are the staunchest opponents to carbon emissions are also among the staunchest opponents to hydroelectric energy or to nuclear energy? 
I think that that suggests there's well, something else going on. I, I, there's Why the different standards for China? L let me, so let I me think just that say, there's something else going on here. That's my well, point about well, there's a religious mm -hmm. conviction that goes beyond a commitment to the facts. Let me just say that even Greta Thunberg, who comes in for a lot of criticism as a quote unquote right. climate, climate cultist, is now in favor of nuclear energy. I agree with you on nuclear, that that should be more of a push, by the way. If you want to stick but, to Greta, I actually respect Greta but, for one thing. She's oh. honest. She says it's not just about the climate. It's about social justice. It's about climate justice. It's about equity. So these are well, things that at sure, least she is actually an honest if you're living of what in the a poor, movement stands for. If you're living in a poor neighborhood in this country, you're more likely to be affected yeah. by you know the toxic plants and bad toxic, toxic chemical Disagree. plants. Disagree. You're more um, likely to be affected water. by restraints on fossil fuels is actually what you're likely to be affected by. I wonder People if are you dying. have because followed. of lack of access to fossil fuels. I wonder if you've followed, though, what's happening in, because, I, you know, you're, you're a capitalist, you're a successful business guy, so you certainly understand yeah. the way that markets work. You look at Florida, you look at Louisiana, you look at Texas, Colorado, California. These are all places that insurance com companies, home insurance companies, are pulling out of because the risk of catastrophic weather um, extreme weather is so great now that it doesn't make sense for them to insure in these marketplaces. Florida, you know, and you talk about the human impact, Florida is becoming virtually uninsurable because of the lack of home insurance companies that are willing to operate in this state. So I don't know how you can look at the situation right now and say that, you know, there aren't already extreme costs being imposed on people, not to mention workers who are falling out from heat exhaustion, et cetera. So, Crystal, I don't take my facts on the climate change debate from what the home insurance market is actually doing. In many ways, that's distorted by the same climate cult manifest yeah. through the ESG movement because the shareholders of these companies, BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, are effectively requiring them to behave that way. Why are they doing it? It's because CalPERS, State of New York, and large pension funds have said they won't invest with the large asset managers unless they're signatories of the Climate Action 100 Plus Network. But, That's but let me say on that too. Dollars. So I, you I mean, know, I've written books about this. We can go into as much depth as you want. Yeah. I know you have, but you, you do know. I mean, on the ESG thing, I have my own critique of ESG. That is greenwashing. That none of these companies care about that. the environment That's or climate or critique. whatever. Um, there, are, there are studies that show that the funds and the companies that claim ESG and they're all about it, et cetera, they're actually dirtier than the other companies. So in a sense, you, you've won on that front. But I, Sagar has a question for you. I don't want to monopolize all the time, and I know that you have a, a limited amount of time yes. for us as well. Actually, my last question for you, Vivek, is on Mexico. Uh, you've talked and been shared a lot of the critique that we've had here on Ukraine about uh, the military-industrial complex, about pursuing things that are not of our strategic interest. But you've talked on your website about using the military to annihilate Mexican drug cartels. I know previously you had at least rhetorically opened your yourself up to an invasion. So, I mean, what are you going to send America's sons and daughters into Mexican territory? What military resources are you going to use? Are we going to declare war on Mexico? How is this all going to work? No, we're not going to declare war on Mexico. My top objective is to get Mexico to take care of its own problems. Sagar, there is a fundamental difference between what's happening with the drug cartels in Ukraine. What's happening in Ukraine does not affect the lives of Americans here on American soil. What's happening with the Mexican drug cartels in Mexico does. So that's just a fundamental difference. But even against that backdrop, absolutely, I don't want to. De declaring war on Mexico would be a boneheaded but idea. You, you I'm not do do say it. So on here's your, what I would do. Uh, on your here's website, though, you, on your website, you do say, use our military to annihilate Mexican drug cartels. So what that's, does that mean? And the Mexican drug cartels are as much of a threat to the sovereignty of Mexico mm -hmm. as they are to the United States. They're more of a threat to the sovereignty of Mexico. So here's what I would do. I've said that I would use, here's what I would commit to doing. Use our military to secure our own southern border. The wall mm -hmm. has been insufficient. Cartel financed tunnels built now underneath that wall. Trucks can drive through them. And then I would work with Mexico diplomatically to say that, listen up, for a tiny fraction of the amount we've already spent in Ukraine as of this date, we can help you solve your own problem and regain your sovereignty. There's a presidential election in Mexico. I think it's an important one in 2024 as well. Thankfully, AMLO is going to be out. Hopefully, new leadership embraces not the hugs, not bullets strategy that he has. I think that's been a mistake. I want to actually help Mexico solve its own problem because that will help us. But All as right. a backstop, 
if they don't solve the problem, then we're going to have to solve our own problem. So wait, so and that's the way I expect this to end. Mexico will solve its own problem. Wait, so what, but what does that mean? What does that mean? Are we talking about drone strikes on cartels in Mexico? Are we talking about cruise missiles? Are we talking about boots on the ground? If Mexico says, we're not working with you. It means we have military on our own border, and there are a series of steps we can take. Turn off foreign aid of any kind to Mexico mm. or Central America until our border crisis is solved. There's a series of steps to take, and I'm convinced that we will never get to the place of actually having to use war of any kind in Mexico. But at the same time, we have to demonstrate our strength to make sure that Mexico is taking care of its problem in a way that AMLO is absolutely not doing based on the posture but that I, Biden's I just taking with be, respect to them. I just want to get a really clear answer. Is there any scenario under which you would use the U.S. military against Mexico's wishes to go into their country and drop bombs, drone strike, or whatever cartels? I will not rule will you out take that, that we would. You I would not rule, rule out that we have okay. to use that we may treat Mexican drug cartels in the way we treated ISIS as terrorists in another country that are posing real risk to Americans. And the risk to Americans is even greater from the Mexican drug cartels than it was from ISIS. That's what I'll say. All right. Well, Vivek, uh, we got to get you in the studio for a little bit longer next time. That. I know you got to go. Yeah, thank uh, you. I'm really grateful for the exchange. And we also appreciate I, I, I the exchange. I have a lot of fun with you guys, so yeah. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Always. All right. Thank we'll you. see you next time. We really appreciate it, and we will see you guys later. Thanks. Hey guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right, we're subscriber funded, we're building something new, we wanna replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So again, to subscribe, it's breakingpoints.com.